Hi there, welcome to episode 123 of the Waveback Music Podcast. My name is Chris. And I'm Matt. And we're here to listen to the most interesting video game music there is. It's one of the most influential game franchises of all time. It's also one of our favorites. Nintendo may not have announced anything yet for its birthday, but Matt and I are going to celebrate the hero of Hyrule the only way we know how. With music! Don your green garb, because tonight we celebrate the 35th anniversary of The Legend of Zelda. Well, hello, Matt. Hello, Chris. This month marks the 35th anniversary of The Legend of Zelda. I don't know if I'm happy about that or if it bothers (laughs) me that I'm older than The Legend of Zelda. (laughs) Yeah, I am. Yeah. So, uh, the, um, we started, <laughs> we started doing, I started doing a YouTube show over on Stone Age Gamer and it's about, uh, like the weird old stuff in my collection and I'm looking at things like, oh, well, everybody knows about this. And then I stop and think like, well, maybe do I they? should do something on Atari 2600 games because maybe most of the people who are watching this aren't old enough to have had a 2600. I mean, I'm barely old enough to have had... Like, it was on its Same. way out when I had it, you know? So, yep. uh, yeah, feeling pretty old. Thanks, <laughs> uh, thanks, Zelda. I'm going to feel a lot older in July when Donkey Kong happens because, uh, you know, that's that's the 40th anniversary, and that's... Ugh. I was also born in 1981. I'm a month older than Donkey Kong. <laughs> oh, I am... Uh, I'm older than Donkey Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Not by much, but... We're not here for Donkey Kong. We're here. We're, for the we're not Zelda. here to talk about how old we are. We're we all, well. I'm. I'm always willing to talk about how old I am, <laughs> and then groan as I get up. Yes, talk about how old I feel. Oh, that's a yeah. whole other conversation. That's, that's another a, podcast for another podcast. Podcast for another podcast. Well, let's uh, let's t- start by talking about our personal histories. We're gonna we're gonna get to the music because we got good music. But let's talk yeah. a little bit about how did you first experience the Legend of Zelda? Um. Uh, Nintendo, the very first game. I-, I swear, there's something about that gold cartridge. God, it's so good. It's so iconic. Like, like wow, you see that guy? I don't know. I don't care where you are. You see that gold cartridge, and you're like, what is that? Hey, you know, imagine being like seven, eight, or nine and, and seeing that for the first time and, you know, throwing that in the, the console and then playing it. Like, I, you know, my early memories of, of playing The Legend of Zelda are like, <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder how like I put on my own pants in the morning at forty. I can't even I can't even comprehend like how I was trying to play that game at you know nine and ten. Please, even in my teens, I was probably still like, what? This doesn't. You know, it was a very ambitious game for the time, and I've seen plenty of interviews. You know, in in my later years with the creator and and oh yeah, I I get what you're going for the big open world. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, adventure and and you know who doesn't have that in them but um you know that was my first experience with it and then um the second game came out and the cartridge was the metallic color again and i was like what but then of course it was a side scroll so it was like what (laughs) um (laughs) you know and you jump ahead to super nes and um oh god that one that one really sticks with me um it's a link to the past right yeah, yeah, Link to the Past. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say there's just so many titles. And, you know, for good reasons. It's an amazing franchise. They, they create such a wonderful universe. A um, lot, of, lot of great characters. A lot of character characters, if that makes sense. A lot of personality. It's just, you know, the, the, as the game... As the capabilities, I should say, rather, of the, the consoles grew, the personalities grew, and... You know, obviously the environments grew and the adventure became more adventure. So it's a lot of fun. But but that one, um, A Link to the Past, really sticks with me. And, like, there are times that I sit around and I'm like, I wish I could go back and play it for the first time all over again. It's <laughs> such, a, such a sense of wonder playing that game. And, like, the graphics. Like, those are some oh, of... Oh, man. That game has, in my opinion, some of the best graphics ever. And... I'm talking to date, you know, playing all the new con, the new next gen console games, things like Death Stranding, where you know that it's Norman Reedus. Like, there's no bones about it. I'm sorry, A Link to the Past has just 
it's gorgeous. It's art it's, direction. It's perfect. So exactly. Gorgeous. It's art direction. Exactly what you're talking uh, about. It's all in that art direction. But we're going to talk a lot more about yeah. Link to the Past yes. later later this year. Heads up, there are no Link to the Past songs on tonight's episode. But this year does contain the anniversary of Link to the Past. So please yeah, so look, don't turn don't turn it off. That. Yeah. <laughs> don't turn us off yet. Yes. <laughs> um and then uh, the 64, you know, Ocarina of Time. I, yeah. I've played, I ha- there's a, I've probably played with the exception of your ill fated, you know, ventures into the CDI. <laughs> uh, I probably played a Zelda on every console that it's been on except for the CDI. Ocarina of Time, uh, Twilight Princess, uh, Wind Waker, uh, Breath of the Wild, um, well, yeah, you know I mean, what? we're we're gonna we're gonna get into all that stuff. I think ta- when yeah. We, yeah, when we get to all the games we talk about, we'll probably discuss some of our personal histories with them as they yeah. as but they the, come. But the if you ask me, the Legend of Zelda franchise is like it's video game royalty, not because it's Princess Zelda, you know what I mean, uh, but because it's it's in that pantheon, in my opinion, of like the first families, you know, you have the Mario Brothers. Yeah. You've got, you know, the cast from Legend of Zelda, you know, one or two others, but yeah, plenty of history with the Zelda franchise. Well, my uh, my personal history, uh, it was funny that you mentioned about the gold cartridge and experiencing that, because that's a, that's a part of my initial Zelda experience that I haven't really even thought about in a long time. The mm. first time I saw The Legend of Zelda, I had come home and uh, from somewhere. My, my sister, my older sister, was playing... Uh, the game in her, uh, her room with one of her friends, mm-hmm. and I'm walk up the I'm walking through the hallway and I hear the dungeon music. Mm-hmm. So that's the first music I ever heard from the Legend of Zelda, and the only thing I had ever seen of the Legend of Zelda was the uh, like the image for the poster or something that came from uh, came in our NES. So I was completely I was more or less unaware of what the Legend of Zelda was at this time. Ooh, you and, gonna uh, learn today. <laughs> I heard this music. I was like, that is really eerie. And I walked into the room and I saw what they were playing. And they were just like, get out, dummy. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my older sister, I'm, a little, no, I'm a little kid. My sister didn't like, like me very much. And so she kicked me out. And I was listening to the music through the walls and <laughs> just listening to them play this game. Like, wow, this is really cool. Because at this, at this point, I had played Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. And I think the Karate Kid it was the only things that I had played on, on, uh, the uh on the nes so um when i when i went back in there when i heard they were done playing because i wanted to like see if i could get a shot at playing it uh it was that my it was her friend's copy of the game and when Mm. she opened up the console and took the cart out i was like (gasps) what because i had never seen a different colored cartridge before and they're all that space gray (laughs) here's this gold cartridge coming out of my system and it was just it was pure love at that moment, and mm-hmm. uh, I begged and begged to get my own copy of uh, Legend of Zelda. And I don't remember when we got our own copy of the first game, but I know we got our own copy of Zelda 2 probably fairly close to launch because I was well acquainted with it by the time the Super Mario Bros. Super Show was a thing. And oh, right. I, I loved the Super Mario Super Show. Every day would rush home from school, just can't wait Same. to watch it. But I lived for Fridays. Because yes, Fridays yes. were the Legend of Zelda, man. And that was Absolutely. so cool. That was the best. And uh, I mean, I've talked about my history with Zelda 2 on our Zelda 2 episode, and I'll get all into it with a, a Link to the Past when we do our Link to the Past episode and then the various other games. But I have, I just posted a video about it. I actually have a quote unquote complete US collection of Zelda games. I have every hey. every single unique US released Zelda game. Um the Nelsonic Game Watch, the uh all three CDI games, the uh the Game and Watch console. The only thing I'm missing is uh there's a couple of like cartridge variants of like a uh, you know, not for resale copy of uh, Majora's Mask or something like that and the player's choice version of uh Wind Waker for GameCube, but that's not actually a different box. It's not really a different thing, so I don't actually count any of that. That doesn't... No, that's not... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the only real thing that's missing 
that is a legitimate different thing. It's the same game, so I have the game, but it's the, um... Oh, what the heck is that stupid thing called? It's the mini classic for, um... God, it must have been in the... It was around when Wind Waker released. Nintendo released, or some company released, a series of like kind of fold in half big old keychain things that were reissues of Game & Watch games. Oh, I oh, I had a friend that had that and I wanted it so bad. So there is a Zelda mini classic that's a repro of the Game & Watch game. Yeah. In this little gold-looking thing and I don't have one because they sell for several hundred dollars now. Yeah, and of course. That's a bummer. But other than that, <laughs> I have the actual Zelda Game & Watch, which is infinitely cooler, so... Yeah, Put that in your pipe. <laughs> but yes, I, I it's my favorite game franchise ever. Um, just bar none. It's right up there. And I'm with you on the video game royalty for me. Video game royalty is Mario, Zelda, and Metroid. Like, that's... Yep. That's that's my top... That's my, my pantheon, yeah. That's the Holy Trinity. And then mm -hmm. right, right next to Metroid and Zelda are Donkey Kong and Kid Icarus for me, which is fun yeah. because that's where it started. That's where it started for me. Cause I used to love, I was just talking about this on, on, on the SAG podcast with Dan last night is the, um, F1 stuff like F1 race for Game Boy, you know, or mm -hmm. Tetris for NES. They used to put all their Nintendo characters in yep. like one place. So mm -hmm. an F1 race, you'd win all these different races and a different character would be cheering you on. And, you know, Mario, Luigi, Bowser, Samus, Donkey Kong, Pit, they were all there. In mm -hmm. Tetris, when you get to that special ending screen, yep. Mario, Luigi, Donkey Kong, Samus, Pit, they're all there. Like, mm -hmm. that was the, that those were the Nintendo mascots. And then, uh, Pit fell off and Samus got shoved down a little bit, but, uh, yeah. It's what it is, but that's how it works in, in my brain. Those games are all, that's, <laughs> that's where it's at, so. But anyway, uh, I could talk all night about Zelda, and in fact, I'm going to. So let's start listening. To, <laughs> let's start listening. To You've some been music. warned. Uh, we each picked five tracks from the history of the Legend of Zelda franchise, and um, uh, did, have you already looked at what all my tracks are? Do you know all of them? Um, you know, even with um artists who release albums even with my favorite artists who release albums i'm very bad with song titles um i read the whole track listing obviously i recognized my stuff because it's the stuff i picked um and no I, like there's a there's a track i want to see if you can guess what game it's from that's all but we'll we'll get there so you wait, <laughs> wait but, but i mean it's written right here well, yeah. If you're right. looking at the if you're looking at the script, then yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a I'm a good co-host. I look at the script. <laughs> Curse you. Anyways, <laughs> why did I write it? <laughs> we each did five tracks, and uh, we're gonna take turns. We're gonna start with Matt's because uh, it chronologically <laughs> came first, and I don't know. <laughs> it's just, just the way right. I wrote them. So, Matt, what is your first track? Uh, my first track comes from the game that started it all, Legend of Zelda. It's the dungeon. Uh, or it's uh, called Dungeon, and um, I, I I know it was used for quite a bit. You know, back then there weren't a ton of uh, tracks in in the game soundtracks. But to me, apart from the main theme, melody and and composition, to me this is like the the second most iconic song in all of Legend of Zelda history. Period. Bar none. It's and probably the song you. you hear the most <clears throat> in the first game. Right. Uh, that uh, juggled with um, the main theme when you're in the overworld. But um, if you think about it, you spend more time, at least yeah, when I absolutely. Play, you, there's <laughs> definitely more time in the dungeons than the overworld. Oh, absolutely. I was terrible at that game. I spent way more time in the dungeons because I just kept dying. <laughs> uh, maybe that's why I chose it because it's so familiar to me. Um, and it'll be familiar to you, so let's, uh, let's dive right into Dungeon from the original Legend of Zelda. <laughs> Thank you. 
a song that is. Oh, there's, man, there's so many like fond memories and nostalgia attached to just that song. Mm-hmm. And and then, of course, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you think about how it's been redone over the years and it shows up in places like Smash Brothers um, or, you know, these these tracks end up in things like Smash Brothers and stuff. And, you know, you have so many other um, gamers like us who are so fond of the music that they go ahead and they they recreate it. Um, you know, there was that it's happened several times and I've missed it every single time. There'd be the orchestral um, uh, concerts of, you know, the Legend of Zelda. And, oh, my and goodness. I, yeah, I've actually seen that three times. Are you serious? That's amazing. Yeah, I got to see it three times and there was a, a website that I got to do an interview with um, the con- uh, not the conductor, but one of the producers on it. I got to go backstage and interview them. What? Uh, That's so cool. Oh my god, I love the Symphony of the Goddess it was called. And yes. It just it blew me away every time. It was so cool. In fact, um the the conductor she would conduct with the Wind Waker, which was just the coolest thing. That's <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Oh my god. And then I, I got I, I saw it on its first run and then on its second run was after Ocarina of Time three D came out, so they upgraded mm. all the um because they would show all the gameplay footage, they upgraded it to the 3DS one, uh, which because the visuals are so much nicer on that. So, oh my God, what an amazing, an amazing experience that was. It was so good. Yeah. So I mean, like, you know, these, like, I personally love this version of this uh, song. Me too. Um, there's there's something that like I don't know if it's again because of my nostalgia for the game, or um. Obviously, it's just a great track. Composition is just fantastic. Um, I don't, you know, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but um, there's so much. It, it's such a simple piece of music, right? When you really like break it apart and you look at its parts, but it comes together just so beautifully. And then, right, my like love the the piece. The loop is great. And then once it's about to loop over, it goes do 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 like I, it just brings me such joy. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, like uh, it doesn't get any better than that. You know what I mean? I, I do. It's it's extraordinarily eerie, and it all comes down yes. to those instrument choices. It makes me think of you hear this song reprised a lot, um, and I think the closest the closest I've ever heard someone really nail the feeling of this to was when this was reused in uh, the new Switch version of Link's Awakening for the Color mm-hmm. Dungeon. Uh, there's a part where it kind of all like comes down a bit, but this uh, reminds me a lot of the uh, vampire killer from the original Castlevania. Where... I was going to say that there's a, there is a, to me, there's very reminiscent um, traces of, or it, it, it nods to, or reminds me of something you would get in a, in a, in a Castlevania game. When specifically because of the tone, it's, it's a very quiet song. Yeah. It's not in your face. It's not high energy. And the same thing with the uh, original version of Vampire Killer. It's not high energy. It's got mm-hmm. a very reserved tone to it. And it helps add to this, the real sense of just, you are completely alone mm-hmm. in this creepy dungeon. And so now go through and <laughs> find good luck. <laughs> good luck. Try not to die. Uh, because there <laughs> is, there's no one coming for you. There's nobody else. This mm-hmm. is it. Yeah. And uh, it, it really, really lends itself to that feeling of solitude, even more than uh, even the original Metroid. Uh, well, not that's not necessarily true. Metroid really does nail that solitude with, with some of the other areas. I'm just thinking of like the yeah. main Brinstar area is very like, you know, majestic and superhero-y. And then you get to the other places like Norfair and it gives you that same kind of sense of solitude. But that was mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's hip to Daka. We're talking Koji Kondo here. And right. this is just... Couldn't be more different from his work in Super Mario Brothers, but it's also oh, just absolutely. so one hundred percent perfect. It, and uh, also when you're t- you're talking about different versions of this song, this was also not just in my head because of the game, but also because of the cartoon. Um, and I mm. wish there was a way to actually get just the music out of that cartoon. I wish there was a way to do it because there's so many '80s cartoon synth versions of 
uh, these uh, Zelda songs, and this was like Ganon's theme. Anytime Ganon was in the underworld summoning demons from his giant demon orb thing or whatever that was, <laughs> uh, this yeah. music, uh, some rendition of this was playing, and it was so cool. Great, great, great pick. Thank you. I mean, again, amongst, you know, my favorite pieces of music um, from the franchise and just uh, in general. Well, let's move on to my first pick, and uh, my first pick is a little bit of a cheat, uh, but <laughs> we did Zelda 2 not that long ago, and when we did it, I talked about the town theme, and a very interesting rendition of the town theme that I had never thought of before came from banjo Gaiali, who, as you all know, I am a ridiculous fan of his work, and quick sidestep, he just released... A, uh, the Super Mario Brothers 2 character selection screen, and I don't know what it is about it that makes me so happy, but I've listened to it like 20 times by now. It's one of his best covers. I just love it. It's so good. But It also anyway, doesn't hurt that he's like a super nice guy. He is. He's one of the nicest humans on the planet. He's, he's just freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he did a cover of Zelda 2's town theme, and that's what we're going to listen to here. Uh, Zelda 2 was another game that just meant so very much to me. Uh, back when you know, a sequel being a complete and total reinvention of the franchise was not, that was the norm. Like, there was no other Zelda sequels. So mm-hmm. how did we know the third game wasn't going to be a racing game? You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's change it up. Let's see where, let's see where it goes. And the music in Zelda 2, originally by uh, Akito Nakatsuka, is super, super good. And I always liked it just as much as the Koji Kondo soundtrack. And th- this town music has always been one of these one of the most wonderful uh compositions but i never really cared for the instrumentation of it now i've heard some really pretty acoustic guitar versions but this version we're going to listen to has a very different like almost town fair vibe to it really reminds me of stuff like um hyrule castle town in uh ocarina Mm. of time or the hyrule castle town from twilight princess you know it's just got this really live music feel to it and i think it's gorgeous and it's it, it's got to be my favorite version of the song i think i've ever heard it's it's magnificent so let's give it a listen here is the zelda 2 town theme as performed by the wonderful banjo guy ali enjoy <laughs> Thank you. 
theme from Zelda 2 is performed by the incomparable banjo guy Ollie. And what what that song gets right is like it's the version of the song that I never knew I always should have imagined it to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's I it makes so much sense that mm-hmm. that's what that song sounds like. And I never would have imagined it with that it's the you know, that that super laid back beat. Because mm-hmm. in the original version, the, the, there's just a little bit of percussion. Like, ch- k- ch- k- ch- k- ch- yeah. like, it's just kind of matching that bass line. Mm-hmm. But just doing that alternating bass snare situation he's got going on there, and the ever so slightly out of tune whistles or flutes or whatever it is that he's playing, it all comes together to sound like... I, I now picture the, sa- the 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 towns like going to like you know the town of Mido or whatever, and just being so alive. It injects this sense of life into this already beautiful piece of music, and it's seriously throw money at this guy. Go to his Patreon, give him your money, buy his music on Bandcamp because I swear, <laughs> as a video game music fan, I've gotten so much joy out of his interpretations of so many songs. And this is one of the ones that was so transformative and so amazing to me. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I can't think of one piece of his music that I've heard that I've been like, nah. I, the whole time I'm listening to this, all I'm thinking is, why can't he be a jerk? <laughs> because quite frankly, like, He's super talented and he's super nice on top of it. Like, oh, come on, man. Save some for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope he hears this and I hope I, I hope he understands how angry at him that he's so nice and talented. <laughs> um, but but more seriously, like I, I everything that you said about this track is absolutely what I love about this track. I, um, you know, we've talked about this before, how we listen to the song at the same time in our own headsets, and we have little conversations perhaps here and there in between. And so uh, as soon as this kicked in, you hear those um, the little horns and the pipes play. I started laughing. I was like, yeah, I, I get it. Meaning I understand what you're saying. It feels like a live vibe. What I love about that sound is that the fact that it's almost out of tune gives me this idea and it goes along exactly with what you're saying. I see a little gazebo and I see a couple people that kind of know how to play instruments. And then mm-hmm. the only people in the town that kind of know how to play instruments and like, can you guys just play something for the festival? And they're like, yeah, all right, I guess so. And this is what they come up with. You know, like the band leader is obviously the most talented of them all, and the rest of them are just kind of, you know, the way you think of a high school band in a movie where they're a ragtag bunch, <laughs> but like, but like in the best possible way. It's, it's, um, I didn't recognize the name, but I absolutely recognize the song, and this is such a fantastic uh, rendition of the song. And I don't know that I'll be able to listen to the original again. I think I might be ruined. Thanks. <laughs> but you know, again, in the best, po- I'm ruined in the best possible way. So, yeah, I, it's it. I don't know if "ruins" the right word, but this is how I'm gonna hear the song in my head when I forever, when I, yeah, forever. It just yeah. it just is so good. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like you know, there's yeah, um, uh, only because this is in my head. I'm a big Black Sabbath fan. I'm also a, a pretty decent Pantera fan. Um, Pantera did a cover of Black Sabbath's. Um, Planet Caravan. So Pantera did a cover of Black Sabbath's Planet Caravan. And, um, you know, Black Sabbath did it well. But when Pantera got a hold of it, it just made it so much better. And to the point where I'm like, yeah, that's not a Black Sabbath song anymore. I'm sorry. It's it's a Pantera song. You know, like Johnny Cash redid um, Nine Inch Nails Hurt. And, you know, it kind of comes to the point where you're like, that's kind of not Nine Inch Nails anymore, which I know might be sacrilegious to some people, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, people just take that thing just, just a little step further and you're like, yes, that's what was missing. So, there you go. No, you're, you're 100% right. That is definitely, that is certainly how I feel about this. This is, th- this version really just completes that song. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's your next pick there, sir? Uh, my next pick is um, Tala Tala Heights from Link's Awakening. Um, mm. I, 
I chose this one because, I, as I said before, you know, that main melody, and I don't even have to hum it, everybody knows it, um, it appears a lot throughout the franchise, obviously, uh, you know, in title screens and stuff. And, you know, I, I like when um, those, you know, if you think about movies, you know, like Star Wars is a perfect example. Luke has his own theme. Vader has his own theme. Um, so I like when composers take those themes and they play with them a little bit and they place them in other places in the film. And, you know, it adds another uh, level of storytelling in my opinion. So, uh, Talatala Heights, uh, for me, it has that main melody, but I, I think of, um, I think of most of the music that exists in the Zelda franchise. I think this one uses that main melody. Uh, I think it uses it among the best ways possible of all the songs that use it, not counting the main theme. Um, yeah. So let's just dive right into Talatala Mountain from uh, Link's Awakening. Enjoy. I've always called it the Telltale Mountain Range. Um, it's T A L T A L, so I, I don't even know how you're supposed to pronounce it. But whatever. What was I, what was I saying? Talatala. Oh, my bad. Yeah, I'm I'm adding syllables. I have a bad habit of doing that. I, that's okay. Uh, 
Well, you just made up a word too, so I feel okay now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agreed with everything you said beforehand about this being one of the best uses of that main Zelda me- melody. Mm-hmm. Uh, this song is <clears throat> brilliant. I remember getting to this uh, first off. This game in general is just such a uh, such a fun little masterpiece, and I remember first playing it on the Game Boy and being kind of turned off at how it was like oh this is just doing Link to the Past stuff but worse like <laughs> that's that's kind of obnoxious but within seconds I walked outside and there was a uh, I mean the the title screen was kind of amazing and uh, then I you know walk around the room I was like okay this is kind of a oh that's a chain jump why is there a chain chomp here? And those urchins look a lot like the Gordos from Kirby. This is a strange game, and I think I love it. And I did love it. You know, the owl shows up and everything, but man, you get to this spot, you start climbing up the mountain and try to, like, things are getting more difficult as you're going north and uh, further north on the map, and then you just make it up the mountain range, and the music changes, and I was like, oh, oh, oh what? <laughs> What's going on here? Because that had not happened in a Zelda game previously. You know, in Zelda, Zelda 2, Link to the Past, you go to Death Mountain, that music's not changing. Mm-hmm. Unless you're in the Dark World in Link to the Past, but that's you know kind of a different animal. The music's different everywhere. But you go up onto the mountain, and then this music starts changing, and I was like, what is this? I shouldn't be here. And then I, I went back down, and then I immediately turned back around. I was like, that sounded good. And I went back up there to this one little spot. I couldn't get anywhere past just this one little spot. And I sat mm-hmm. there, and I listened to the music for a couple of minutes. Like, wow, this is good. <laughs> I love this darn game. Right. Uh, and yeah, this this is one of those songs that's always stuck with me. And uh, the, the whole game in general, the, the remake on Switch was just, just beautiful. And uh, I love it. Great pick. Great pick. Thank you. Um, I think among my favorite parts, obviously the, the main melody, as I mentioned before, is uh, just among my, my favorite just composed melodies of all time. Um, but I love... There's such... A lot of great stuff to this like um when when the drums drop out and you just get that just that one brief moment for dynamic uh-huh. it, it it excites me so much i'm like oh yeah right and then so and then good. it and then it goes into that bass doom, 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 oh and doom, it doom. sounds so full right i the only thing that upsets me about that is it lasts for so short a period of time I, I, and that's I, part of what makes it special. <laughs> oh, abs- no, no. I, I'm well aware, like, if it lasted any longer, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. As opposed <laughs> to, like, I love that part. And then um, later on, there's the part where kind of the bass and the drums kind of just go like, doom, 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 yep. with the music. I just, like, such a great composition, like, really, really using dynamic to... Um, to your benefit to create such a, a dynamic piece you know very that makes it very thoughtful um yeah, just to throw yeah. out the names uh it's uh minako hamano kozui ishikawa and i believe the bulk of the work uh, i don't know this for certain but i believe the bulk of the work was done by kazumi totaka but i mean my hat's off to you three like just a fantastic job in every conceivable way absolutely all right, my pick. Now, this is going to seem a little silly, but uh, <laughs> I really did want to throw this out there, and I don't mean this in any sort of ironic way, okay? I need to tell a story about why I've chosen this song. <laughs> Let me settle in here. So this is... Uh, we're going to be listening to a song from Link, Faces of Evil, for Philip CDI. Now... <laughs> These games are legendarily awful, um, and they are as, as bad as they say, but but let me preface this by putting you in a position that some of you may have actually been in as well. I started with the original Legend of Zelda, became quickly obsessed with the franchise through Zelda 2 and the animated series, right? Now that cartoon was it for me, right? That's in my brain like, wow, I love this cartoon. Then A Link to the Past shows up and completely just blows my world in two. A Link to the Past was such a... It was a watershed moment for me. Mm -hmm. It showed me how much more games could be. It looked like what my imagination 
thought the original mm-hmm. game should mm-hmm. look like. The the gra- the colors, the grass was green, the water was blue, the lost woods, everything. Game is a freaking masterpiece. Yes. So what's next? Where does <laughs> Zelda go from here, right? <laughs> Link's Awakening, okay? Link's Awakening comes out for Game Boy, and while visually it's not as impressive as A Link to the Past, it could never be, but it was portable Zelda. And it had such a personality, and that, and by the time it was over with that, the, the story and everything, it was all heartbreaking. I was, again, completely and totally solidly blown away. What I wanted Zelda to do after Link's Awakening was to revisit Zelda 2. Okay, so we had Zelda, the top down, then we had Zelda 2, which was this amazing sidestep, but then we went for 3 and 4 back to the top down thing. I would love more than anything for them to take another swing at side-scrolling Zelda. Now, Ocarina of Time was a ways off. Uh, you know, Z- the N64 yeah. was a twinkle in the eye somewhere. I had no idea what was coming next for Zelda. As a kid, you get up in the morning and you watch your Saturday morning cartoons, but if they haven't started yet, sometimes you would turn on the TV and channel surf which you young folks don't really understand what that is uh but you just (laughs) you'd flip through the channels and see what was on and one day i landed on before all of my cartoons started i i feel like this was a sunday morning thing more than a saturday morning thing but that's just tucked in my mind either way one weekend morning super early i came across an infomercial where there's this guy named phil talking to this sentient wall about the meaning of life and it was a, an infomercial for the Philips CDI, which we all know it's like a joke now. But then, when you think about technology of then, the Philips CDI was this, it was, it was the future. It was, they were talking about, and here's Compton's interactive encyclopedia, and they're moving things around and interacting with an encyclopedia. And I look over at the wall, and there's an encyclopedia set on my wall, like, Oh my god, this is incredible. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at this like as a little kid thinking, this is the future of video games right here. Look at this stuff. This is crazy cool. And you're seeing all this, you know, sticky bear reading or whatever, all this fully animated stuff that looks like cartoons. And then the the guy says something to the effect that Phil says something like, uh, well, do you have anything a little bit more challenging? And he says, Why don't you try the faces of evil? And Ooh. The title screen for Faces of Evil they shows up, and it says, Link, the Faces of Evil. And my heart dropped. I was like, <gasps> what? And this song we're about to listen to is what played. As it started, this song plays, and you see the, honestly, really cool-looking map that, you're, that, you, that, that shows all the different places that you can go. And they start showing the gameplay, and they start showing some of the cinematics. Now, I'm a little kid. I've obsessed over the Zelda cartoon and this Zelda stuff when you're not really hearing all the really crappy dialogue and acting looks like the cartoon it looks Mm -hmm. like that Super Mario Brothers Super Show cartoon in a video game now you've got scenes like that you've got this incredible map and then they start showing some of the gameplay I had no idea that it controlled like trash it just looked like (laughs) a new side-scrolling Zelda game and I was like I need this in my life. I need this. And I begged my parents for the CDI over and over again, and they never bought it for me because it was insanely expensive, and thank goodness they didn't because I probably would have hated this game. It would have made me so sad and so angry. But this song, and really a lot of the music in Link Faces of Evil and its companion game, Zelda Wand of Gamelon, the music's pretty solid. It's not like Koji Kondo-worthy stuff, but there's some really cool pieces in there and this world map theme is one of them because for me this was this was what the future of zelda was this song right here was just this heart pounding moment for me and it's a pretty cool tune so this (laughs) is uh this is world map theme from link faces of evil for philip cdi by tony trippy and william havlick 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 i think is how you say that either way they did an admirable job on a soundtrack to an unfortunately terrible game. So let's give it a listen. World map theme from Link Faces of Evil.
you have it. So now imagine if you would that you that you don't know that that song is connected to a very bad game. And everything you had heard out of a Zelda game before this, the highest fidelity you had gotten was the Super Nintendo. Now you see a CD-based system that has music that sounds like that for its map screen. Can you understand why I was hyped for this game? <laughs> Listen, I don't know. <laughs> I almost feel like you're trying to plead your case, and you don't have to, dude. We we get it. We've all been fooled before. Um, I get, but I get it though. I mean, like that is a fantastic piece of music, even even with its dated roto toms. Of course, I, yeah. I still loved it. I I don't think I've ever heard it before. I don't think I've I've maybe seen like a total of like a minute of you know this particular game and some of the other ones um but that was a great piece of music i don't care i i i'm so happy to hear you say that and yes i i agree it's it's a very cool piece of music it's uh you know there's not a, a lot to it because it's it's map music you're you choose a place to go on the map so you don't hear it for very long stretches at a time um but it's uh, the the game has this sort of um, you know you, you you you're when you're looking at the map you're usually uh, in the beginning of the game when you look at the map you're on a flying carpet so it has that kind of like Middle Eastern vibe to it to begin with but yep. just that those like those synthesized strings and everything just scream early CD ROM this is the future like this was pre Polygon future of gaming stuff and it's uh, that is a a point in gaming history that has always fascinated me and probably one of the reasons that i have so much of an issue with uh where things went from here was that this is where i thought things were going and how much better i think th i thought things were going to get in this direction before they went 3d and mm -hmm. polygonal and Honestly, when we listen to the next track, you'll hear a little bit of just a tiniest smidgen of my disappointment in instrument fidelity as a Nintendo fan, because right. for as utterly brilliant as the soundtrack to the next one we're going to be listening to is uh, the instrument fidelity, because it was still a cartridge based system, was, pro was slightly problematic for me. Mm -hmm. And... I don't know, man. When I finally did get this game and played it, it's the CDI is not a great system. It's just not. But it yeah, is a no. fascinating piece of video game history, and there is good. There is good and interesting <laughs> in Link Faces of Evil and Zelda Wand of Gamelon. Not much. I do not recommend seeking them out to play them. If you can play those new remade ones, somebody recently, quote unquote, fixed these games. Um, huh. And they didn't change the visuals or anything like that. They just made the controls work. So you don't have to stab the rupees to pick them up. Uh, it, it just moves like a video game instead of something that wants to be a video game someday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at the little video game that tried. Oh, boy. Well, that that's, that's my weirdo pick for the night, and I, I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah, I, uh, everything you said about the flying carpet and the synthesized strings and stuff, like, um, again, I, I really know nothing about this game. So when you said flying carpet, it all, like, had a, like I had, like, a aha moment. Like, the roto toms make sense. The, the yeah. drum pattern being played makes sense. The synthesized strings, to some extent, that, like, um, almost, <laughs> and I say I use almost as in, like, a 25 to 35% almost flute sound synthesized string sound like i, I get it I, I really do but uh, you know it all the trappings of you know that time period musically sonically it's to me it still works really 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 well so thank you for bringing that to the table because i never i don't think i'd ever seek this game out like ever i know that you played them for um the pain in the ass mm -hmm. uh but i did and, it in the middle of the night so. and and you're a much better man than I am, so <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm I'm really happy to to uh, to have heard that. I'm happy to share one of the few positives uh, of those <laughs> games with the rest you know, of the world. 
You know, I, I, I take the Paul Heyman approach to life, accentuate the positives and hide the negatives. And really, that story that I told about this, that whole thing with that infomercial was just... Uh, it's one of the reasons I will always love that platform and these games in particular. They, they're just a, a source of unobtainable fascination to me because then you, you tack on top of the fact that I was never able to get them until I was much older. Mm -hmm. They always held this mystique like because nobody talked about them. Like they, It wasn't like there was the internet out there to talk about how great or how terrible these games were. I right. saw them in Electronics Boutique and was like, oh man, I wish I could buy this, but I don't have the system. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Then I didn't hear anything for forever. And so I just had these built up in my head. Like, there are three Zelda games out there that I've never played. And nobody I know has ever played. And nobody's ever talked about them before. And I want to know what they're like. <laughs> and then I finally, I did finally get my CDI when I worked at Funko Land. But then I didn't get, I couldn't find these games because nobody had them. And there was barely a secondhand market. I couldn't find them on eBay. And then they started going for stupid prices. And then I eventually found them years and years later. But by that point, the secret was out. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Those games you thought were like amazing hidden gems are actually some of the worst games you'll ever play. God. I mean, I like I said, we've all been fooled before by games and I know that feeling, but um, I also do know what it is to, to have a mystique around a game and just be like, I don't care. I, I need to play this. But, yeah. And that was where I was at. I didn't care. All right, Matt, take us to the next one. Take us to a true Zelda classic. Oh man. Um, where do I begin with this game? Uh, you know, when when searching for tracks for tonight's episode, um, it's funny that I I don't want to say that I forgot about this game per se, because the game itself is based around a musical instrument. It's like, well, duh, you're gonna pick a song from this game. Like, what are you dumb? <laughs> uh, that game, of course, is Ocarina of Time, and I think I feel like where uh, a link to the past is probably my opinion hot take top two best games in in the entire franchise ocarina time i think for a lot of people is more memorable because of the actual ocarina and having to play it and there, it came you know the game itself had just a wide birth of a soundtrack but then on top of it had these little melodies that also had full pieces to them mm -hmm. um and there's just a lot of great music in that game. I was um, I was listening today, the day of recording, I was listening to some of it. Uh, just some random tracks, too. Uh, I had already picked this song that we're going to listen to, and I'll give you the name in a second. But there were quite a few um, dungeon pieces that I was like, oh, I remember this one. Oh, I remember this. Oh, oh. You know, one after the other, I was like, oh, oh, oh. And then, you know, I started pulling out my Jeff Goldblum, and I'm like, that's not a euphemism, by the way. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, oh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. You know. Um, but uh, this one, uh, Song of Storms. There's just something about it that, like, like the kids say, it just hits differently. Um, and let's see if you guys agree. This is a uh, song of storms from the Ocarina of Time. <laughs> percent right when you say this one just hits differently there's a <laughs> a real feeling of mystery now the ocarina of time soundtrack i love top to bottom it's one of the yeah rare exceptions on the nintendo 64 where the it's one of those situations where the compositions really outdoes my distaste for the sound um the nintendo 64 obviously couldn't do cd quality sound so all 
in that generation, so much truly amazing music was coming out of the PlayStation at the time and the Saturn at the time, and even stuff like the CDI and the 3DO uh, and, and PC. But then you have the Nintendo 64 and you've got these very, um, you know, I don't know if compressed is the right word, but very fake sounding instruments. And you listen to them now and there is a, a there is a, a certain charm to them, but it's not like chiptune charm. It's like, right. Here's some really crappy instruments they used to play <laughs> some really amazing music. Uh, <laughs> And there are, Majora's Mask, I think, suffers from this just dreadfully, where there's yeah. a lot of really great tunes in there, but I hate the instrument choices. I um, will absolutely agree with you on a lot of that. But uh, this song in particular had, had such a, a mystery to it, and it was really eerie, because it's just used in that windmill. You walk in there, and there's this completely nuts guy. Yeah. <laughs> with a creepy look on his face and a, and this little box. And he's just cranking it and playing this music. He's round and round and round and round. I'm like, okay, buddy. Yeah, I'm, whatever you say. <laughs> I'm going to go. Please yeah. don't please don't kill me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been fighting monsters. I just killed a giant spider inside of a giant talking tree. You are the scariest thing I've seen yeah. in this game. Yeah. <laughs> And then you come back later and you play the song of storms inside and it starts raining and he loses his mind. As if it wasn't already gone. Right? It's like whatever little threads of sanity he was holding on to are gone. That guy is broken. And it's like, I I don't even know. This was, it's the weirdest, most second most unsettling thing in Ocarina of Time. The most unsettling thing is the Skulltella house. When you walk in there and the dude's half transformed to a Skulltella and I'm like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> kill it with fire. <laughs> side note, <laughs> side note, speaking of kill it with fire, not related to anything. I just found out there's a game coming out for the Switch called Kill It With Fire. Yes. Where you go around killing spiders with overkill. Yes. I just saw it the other day, and I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. Sign me up. Anyway, so, but this song was an incredibly memorable piece from an incredibly memorable soundtrack, and it, is, it definitely has its a huge cult following as a song. Like, it's one of those things that just, if you're a Zelda fan, this is one of those songs that always gets its own treatment. Like, this song had its own, its own version in Smash Brothers, its own section in... Um, the symphony of the goddess you know like this is one of those things that people really gravitated to as just a really eerie memorable song and it's a fantastic pick and i think for me uh my or i should say what draws me to to it uh yeah of course the mystery of it there is um uh, sonically it's uh it's composed in a way that allows for an air of mystery um <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Something came up with that. All right. Um, what draws me to it, though, is the fact that it is very uh, sea shanty. And long before, like, the TikTok challenge and stuff, I was very much about sea shanties. Like, I, there's just something so interesting about them. Um, you know, the, the songs that workers make up to pass the time is just great. But this is, a, you know, this piece to me has that nautical has that sea shanty feel uh has the mystery vibe as you put it the eerie vibe it's it's just a great piece of music and like there's nothing uh, really fancy about it um when you think about it or, or for me when i think about it in the grand scheme of things i think it just it just falls right into that that neat little category of sea shanty nautical and um you know in in a soundtrack of just great music this is one of the ones that really sticks out and obviously as you said it it got its own um you know portion of the the concert uh with the orchestra and stuff so i mean it can't obviously it's not just me and you that that see or or hear it in this case so no yeah. definitely not it's one of those it's one of those songs that that people really gravitate towards yep well uh my next pick is Probably not one of those songs that people gravitate towards. <laughs> I 
don't really hear people talking about it all that much, but they probably will be soon. So uh, my next pick uh, comes from The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, which is a somewhat underplayed uh, game in the franchise, I, I, I believe. This was a very late Wii release. This was, uh, you had to use the Motion con- mo- motion Plus controller for it, so it came packaged with a Wii Motion Plus controller. And this was when the franchise was getting a bit stagnant. Um, mm-hmm. They still, d- I still loved the games, like Twilight Princess and obviously Wind Waker and whatnot. I, I still really, I lost my mind every time there was a new Zelda game. But the hype for the franchise had died down considerably because things had gotten a bit formulaic as far as like here's ocarina of time this is the one everyone loves uh and we're just going to kind of try and build on this formula a bit and the games that followed it uh particularly twilight princess which had the most eyeballs on it because that was the one that had that crazy trailer that everyone was like oh my god they're making a big mature zelda it's gonna be the coolest thing ever and it, it it didn't impress the way that it it should have Mm -hmm. And also from being on the Wii so late in its life, people weren't buying Wii games anymore, especially not core gamers buying, you know, adventure games like this. And especially gamers that weren't interested in motion controls playing a game that was exclusively motion controls. Yeah. I loved this game, though. And when they announced that this was getting an HD remake on the Switch with regular normal person controls, uh, I was... (laughs) completely just over the moon for it. I was like, this is, this is great. Now they, the fact that that entire Nintendo direct, I have, you know, different feelings about, uh, it didn't blow me away the way I'd hoped it would, but there were things in it that made me very happy. And Skyward Sword being released in HD is one of them because this is a very, very beautiful game and it tells a really nice story. Um, for all of its issues with the overworld, uh, it does, does have a lot of, you know, somewhat empty areas. There's a lot of backtracking and whatnot. It's not a perfect game, but it tells one of the one of the coolest stories I think in the franchise and has some of the most memorable characters, including uh, a version of Zelda that takes. I'm gonna come off sounding kind of weird here, and I, I hope it, <laughs> I, I hope it doesn't come off uh, as crappy. But one of the video games suffered in female characters for a long time with the damsel in distress situation, right? Yeah. You had your original Zelda, your original Princess Toadstool. They, there was absolutely zero empowerment there. They, women in video games were, you know, prizes to be won. Uh, then there came this kind of turn where uh, Lara Croft existed, and now women in video games had to be sexy badasses. Yeah. And they, uh, the version of Zelda, in eventually that kind of tempered out and you started to get genuinely good female representation in video game not a lot of it not nearly enough as there should be but you started to see some characters like Midna uh, in Twilight Princess uh, and Zelda herself in Twilight Princess were you know Zelda was still in the the, the dress but she had a sword you know and it was female empowerment and good female characters in video games always had to be badasses in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword Zelda is similar to the way she is in um, the game that followed this, Breath of the Wild, that totally reinvented the franchise. Zelda is a badass for a very different kind of reason. She's not, you know, sassy and that kind of strong or anything like throwing out one-liners. She's intelligent. (laughs) She's intelligent and she's brave. And you do have to save her. your, Your mission is going after her, but because what she's doing is not something, you know, that involves a physical prowess of fighting a thing. She's doing something that is incredibly important that only she can do. And it's something that I really liked about this representation of Zelda is that she was not portrayed as some sort of physically strong character. She was just portrayed as as a normal person who had a destiny that she never asked for and wound up having to go through stuff like, I don't want to spoil the game, and I don't remember all the details, but I just remember going through this game, and I really liked the character of Zelda. This was also the first game in the franchise that was overt about there being a romance between Link and Zelda. Mm-hmm. They were childhood friends in this game. This is also the earliest story game in the franchise. It tells about the formation of the Master Sword, and 
the uh, the reason Link is always dressed the way he is throughout history. Like it gives a lot of really really cool lore. And one of the first songs that I heard from this game was uh, the romance theme, which was in one of the earlier trailers for Skyward Sword when they were showing off this romance between Link and Zelda. Like there was a flirtation there. And this is, without a doubt, one of the most gorgeous pieces of music that's ever appeared in a Zelda game. It is a very, very pretty theme. <coughs> and uh, it's not one that I hear referenced. And I don't hear Skyward Sword referenced at all by a lot of people because it was, I guess it was just so underplayed. And when you think about Skyward Sword or when people talk about Skyward Skyward Sword, this is the internet. So you're going to focus on the negative stuff, right? Remember how crappy all the dousing stuff was? You always had to hold your sword up straight in the air and motion control, blah, 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 blah. Sure, the game had a lot of problems, but it also did a lot of really good stuff. And this song, the game soundtrack in general, but this song in particular is one of my favorite things from the game. So uh, this is Romance Theme from Skyward Sword by Hajime Wakai, Shiho Fuji, Mahito Yokota, Takeshi Hama, and Koji Kondo, who are all the people listed on this game's soundtrack. And this is just one of my absolute favorite pieces of music from Zelda. Enjoy. <laughs> just don't don't do it justice how much i love that song <laughs> but we're gonna try anyway <laughs> we're gonna try what a, a a gorgeous piece of music and it and it, it accompanies this god it's been so long since i've played that game I, it accompanies this um it's a lot of zelda flirting with link and uh she's about to do this whole ceremony with a sailcloth or something like that and I know there's this whole thing where you're supposed to bond with your loft wing and there's lots of like just it's like learning to fly and in, at the same like literally learning to fly on this giant wing this like giant bird thing and then also just this I remember the trailer more than anything and <laughs> the trailer where I first heard this song 
is like it's going through all these cute little scenes with Link and Zelda, and they're they're jumping off a cliff and landing on their birds and and flying away, and then the song gets very abruptly interrupted um, because it's when Link and Zelda are flying and their eyes kind of meet like, yeah, these these two like each other, <laughs> and mm-hmm. then the sky opens up and Zelda gets pulled through this this portal and Link like tries to go after her and fails and it's this song is so emblematic of the 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 feelings that this game uh uh, provided me with and for for me and games like this is i can get over a lot of negativity if its heart is in the right place Mm -hmm. and this game's heart was in the right place the whole time like for every bit of something that was not great like the dousing or whatever you had something like this scene in the desert where if you stand near a rock it creates a field around it that is in the past so you're walking in this circle that's in the past but outside of the circle is in the present there's so much crazy creativity stuff in this game that really stuck with me and so when I look back on Skyward Sword when I think back to that game I remember the stuff that I loved way more than the stuff that I didn't and when a Zelda game comes out and typically speaking the music that you hear or the music that I look for and look forward to is the stuff that is somehow related to music from older games being reprised when a new original piece like this or like um what we just listened to, uh, the the Song of Storms, a new mm-hmm. original piece comes in that impresses me so much. Uh, it really just sticks with me to to no end. And I'm assuming you haven't really played Skyward Sword. I'm gonna be. I don't know anything about it. It's one of the few um, Legend of Zelda games that I know Zip Zero about. Well, hopefully you pick up the Switch version. Because it's, uh, the, it's a the, special game. The fact that you said that it got an HD remake and that you don't have to worry about the motion controls, um, that already sold me. Like, Not that I ever had a problem with motion controls. One of my favorite games uh, probably of all time is all the Metroid Prime games. I thought they were fantastic. But oh, uh, yeah. I know that the description of, of um, this uh, Zelda game is a little bit different. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I'm absolutely interested. I will say this about the motion controls in this game. As excited as I am to play it with an analog stick, I li- where I lived at the time, the motion controls worked almost flawlessly for me the entire time, and it adds so much <laughs> to this game in particular because the combat is built around the ability to swing your sword in any direction. Mm-hmm. So you'll be fighting uh, like a Stalfo or whatever, and he'll hold his sword one way, so you have to attack where his sword isn't. Yeah. Or if they're holding their swords out to the side, you got to slash vertically so you can slice in the middle. Or if they're you know holding them horizontally, you got to slash horizontally to get in between those swords. And oh, there's a robot boss fight called Kalactos that I'm not going to spoil, but good God gravy, that is a, one of the <laughs> best. Honestly, one of the things that you will hear about Skyward Sword is like even somebody absolutely trashing the game would be like, but that Kalactos battle was one of the coolest things in any Zelda game ever. And they're not wrong. So I don't know if I'm going to play this game entirely with Joy-Cons, but I'm going to try it with Joy-Cons first. Mm -hmm. um, Because, boy, it is the way the game was intended to be played. Anyway, go on. I want to hear your thoughts on this this wonderful song here. Um, The first thing I thought was, what a beautifully understated uh, piece of music. Um... (laughs) Uh, to 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 what you said like um you know there's never really uh, a romance storyline through line for Link and Zelda you know uh, you're you're an audience member and i feel like you want that to be a thing like come on it's it's link and that's zelda like duh. and for and for people of a certain age we grew up with a cartoon where there was an implied romance Correct. between link and zelda link was always trying to get a kiss so it was like that's the thing that was always kind of there in our mm-hmm. heads as American audiences, but it was never actually in the games. Right. So, um, you know, I feel that there's no point of reference to what 
their romance a would be and b what it would sound like because you know after all we are doing a music podcast um and i think that this song is the perfect embodiment of that um I think if you hadn't told me this was from a Legend of Zelda game, I I might not um, be able to place it, but I feel like it's one of those things that's like the tip of your tongue. Like, Mm -hmm. like, there's something very familiar about the composition and yet uh, something very brand new about it. And I think that's... I think that's a testament to um, every composer who, who sat down and worked on any one of these games was like being able to harken back to kind of the foundation of the franchise and yet be able to create like each game a different experience because um you know sure a lot of the games gave you that top down three quarters whatever you want to call it um and the games had a feel to it but i feel a lot of the games look very different you know you 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 look at part one versus part two drastic change in style you Mm -hmm. know art department whatever you want to call it gameplay um and so so a testament to each composer testament to each you know uh game designer like i feel that every game that exists in the franchise is its own standalone like i feel that they've done a great job of being able to say like yeah, you could just drop in on this game and you don't necessarily have to know everything that came before. Like, you're not missing anything to enjoy this game, unlike some other games. And so this piece of music is definitely that. Like, uh, I always talk about, you know, some of its parts. Um, You know, this song is first and foremost brilliant, beautifully composed, um, samples in it amazing Uh, it just it's just a a fantastic piece of music and you know sight unseen know nothing about the game i feel like this is just another example of how they were able to create uh a standalone amongst a franchise of standalones if that makes any sense yeah that does make sense i understand what you're saying Excellent. Okay. Because <laughs> sometimes I think I make sense and then I say the words and I'm like, that didn't make any sense. Who the, who put me on this podcast? I shouldn't be allowed to talk. Nope. Me no speak it a good English. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the uh, I believe this game's coming out on the Switch in July. And if you've never played it before and you've always been a Zelda fan and you've heard... Yeah. The mixed reviews of it, please give this game a try. It really does have its heart in the right place. And I'm, I'm looking at a video now of the comparison. And just the game appears to be running at 60 frames per second, which is not what the Wii game ran at. Uh, it's it's not giving like really new geometry, it seems, to anything. But that's probably because it doesn't really need it. Unless you were to really rebuild the thing from scratch. But honestly, just right. cleaning up what was there seems to be working some real wonders with this game it just looks it doesn't look like you know as amazing as breath of the wild but it's really really impressive so no, some, i'm excited you know, some, sometimes you just need to get the gunk out of the corners and and you know just a little polish and and you'd be surprised what new life you breathe into it well it's like we were talking about with um with a link to the past the, the legend of zelda franchise has always had some of the strongest art direction out there yeah and you know something like this is really kind of a midway point between uh, Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, whereas mm-hmm. this does in fact look a bit a bit dated because it, because it is you're you've you've upresed a Wii game now you've done it in a very gorgeous yeah. way and clearly they put a lot of love and care into making it look good but uh, Wind Waker doesn't have that problem because Wind Waker looks perfect as is you can put you can plug that game in a GameCube and run it run it through a uh, like a component cable or something out of a GameCube, and it looks fantastic even on an HD TV. Whereas the Wind Waker mm. HD just looked as good as anything on the Wii U. The, the mm. Wind Waker HD is just solid, gorgeous, but it's because of its art direction. It used you know more simple geometry in the cell shading, and that just that just ages better. Whereas when Twilight Princess HD came out. I saw a lot more seams in it. I looked at that and said, you know what? The art direction in this game is a bit 
garish at times and mm -hmm. that's you know that that's a thing that's that that kind of bothers me so i don't know man it's this game <laughs> this game looks really good and i'm very excited to play it again um because i love zelda games and go. i think we are at about no we each got a um, we just got a few more picks left, so uh, what is your next choice, my dude? My <laughs> that caught me way the hell off guard. Um, so speaking of the Twilight Princess, um, I enjoyed that game. Um, As did I. I was um, pleasantly surprised by it. I, I don't think I, I had uh, expectations, per se. I do that a lot, like... I try and stay away from trailers from movies and TV shows and stuff because I've learned that, you know, overhyping something and then you play it and it's, you know, it's good. And maybe if it wasn't overhyped, it would be great. I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I fall victim to that. Um, so I didn't have major expectations of Twilight Princess and I really enjoyed it, though. Um, and uh, this song is weird because I don't actually remember it in the game. Uh, I don't actually remember a lot of the game. I don't remember a lot of life, but that's a whole other set of podcasts. Um, but the, but again, going back and and listening to the soundtrack, I remember uh, I remember a bunch of these these tracks. Uh, I remember really enjoying them. Uh, it did bring the nostalgia back of the game, uh, certain parts of it and stuff like that. But this song, uh, when I when I gave you the name, you'd ask me like because you found a, it was one of those songs that has a couple of different names. Um, so for purposes of this episode, we're going to call it Forgotten Village. Um, this song I listened to while listening to the uh, official soundtrack, and I said, yeah, this is a song that, like, it's another one, like uh, Storm, that I feel like just hits a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll explain why I feel that way afterwards. Um, so for right now, we'll just do Forgotten Village from The Twilight Princess. Enjoy. It is definitely one of the most um, American Western movie inspired Zelda <laughs> songs there is, you know? Absolutely. Like, that is as that is 100% inspired by American Western films, and not in a bad way. It's a it's a really great piece, um, and it, it, it kind of plays off of the, the main melodic theme of, uh, of Twilight Princess, and I do remember this song quite well. Uh, it's, it's one of the ones that I've 
gone back to and my listening of various Zelda soundtracks over the years. Uh, I think it's a wonderful. I think it's a wonderful piece. It's a great choice. And before I go uh, completely hog wild with my history with Twilight Princess, I'll I'll, I'll let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, bud. No, um, <laughs> for me, exactly what you said. It's it's very much you know American Western. Uh, one of the things I was thinking was, it's someone's impression. Of someone <laughs> doing an impression of a Sergei Leone, uh, <laughs> Anero Mar- Mar- Maricone music, because you know, he, you know, Sergei Leone did the spaghetti westerns better than anyone. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, but then, of course, you look. Uh, so I was looking for um, just some f- pictures of the of the actual Forgotten Village, and for the record, it keeps coming up Hidden Village. So again, I, like I said before. You know, we talked about it having multiple names, so... Yeah, I've seen it listed as a bunch of things. I wrote Forgotten Village because that's what the version of the soundtrack I have had it mm-hmm. listed as, that's all. And and that's what came up when I when I was listening to the uh, OST. Um, but, you know, if we got it wrong, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's named a couple of things, so... <sighs> anyway, <laughs> but um, if you look at photos of, of the village, or if you remember this particular part from the game, it, it has a very Western vibe. The You know, the town, the little village, the town, whatever you want to call it, is made out of wood. There's those little wooden walkways that you think of, you know, of John Wayne walking down or, you know, someone getting tossed out of a saloon onto or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about it all the time where you create this nice, neat package, you know, your art. Uh, your art has uh, one vibe and one feel and you want the music to match it and this is one of those instances where the music absolutely like 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 an, a hammer to a nail just hits it right on the head and I mean I think it's I personally think it's just a great little tune like yeah it, it, the loop is a little short um, and you know if you're like me you pick it up pretty quickly but like but not in a grading way I think um, I I think it, it just it's so well put together the jews harp is just like like the 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 chef's kiss right on top it's just perfect you know the little lone whistle a la you know the good the bad and the ugly and stuff like that obviously you got your acoustic guitar and you know it just it just comes together and just like i like the only word i could think is like pleasant it comes together in such a pleasant way like i i can't listen to this and not just be like like bopping and smiling like Yes, yeah, it's, it's a pleasant little tune, you know? So. Yeah, it's not an inherently happy piece of music. No. Uh, but it is a very pleasant one to listen to. Yeah, so. Go ahead and hit me with your history with this game, buddy. I know, like, you're just dying. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's going to be a long time before we actually get to this game you yeah. know, in our Zelda uh, continuity, so... So, you know, you get the, uh, before the GameCube launches, you get that, that video. You know what I'm talking about? The, the legendary trailer of, uh, Link fighting Ganondorf, the sword fight. Mm hmm. And that's, that's in my brain. That's, oh my God, that's what Zelda is going to look like on GameCube. Give me a GameCube immediately. Hook it up to my eyeballs. Like, <laughs> I must have watched that thing as many times as I could get my hands on it because back then, you know, the internet wasn't quite as prevalent. So it wasn't as easy to watch it. And when you did, you're watching it on this, a little window the size of a postage stamp in super low resolution because that's Ugh. all you, that's the only ba- thing your bandwidth could handle at the time. Yeah. And, I was so enthralled by it. Just loved it to death. And then they announced Wind Waker. And it was a complete left turn from that. And that original Wind Waker trailer is still one of my most hated trailers in the world. I, I, I it's, <laughs> it's awful. It just looked awful. And then when the game came out, it turned out to be my favorite game of all time. And uh, I'll talk more about that a little later. But um, when they did the, the Twilight Princess was the ultimate one more thing moment. I remember watching that E3 and being like they la- they they kicked it off with Metroid Prime 2 and this was the this was the E3 where they showed off Resident Evil 4 and I was like, mm. "Oh my god, GameCube is it really has some amazing stuff." And yeah. they're wrapping it up and wrapping it up and Reggie does the it's one more world we want you to look at and it shows this like the their little stream, the river and a field and I'm like, "Wow." what is this? What is this? And then you see the horse running. I'm like, is this Zelda? Is this Zelda? And you hear this, you've seen, you've seen the video of like people watching it at E3 and just screaming at the top of their lungs. Bananas. I was at, I was at my apartment in Brooklyn 
watching this thing and I'm one of those people that cried. <laughs> I was in <laughs> tears by the end of that thing because as soon as the camera panned around, it was Link and he pulls out his sword and you got that Conan music playing in the background yeah. and it just looks amazing and it's this real like gritty grown up looking Zelda thing now Wind Waker had proven to me that I didn't actually need that and truth be told I I never need Link to be a dark and gritty thing and eventually this, that's not what this game turned out to be it was right. certainly darker and grittier than, than other Zelda games but it was still a, a Zelda game it still had that spirit behind it of being very whimsical and kind of goofy at times mm-hmm. and but man, when that trailer, <laughs> Blades Will Bleed, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I followed this game's tr- uh, the, this game's every trailer I could I could get my hands on, uh, like you wouldn't believe. I was just so completely excited for it. And when it came out, and it wasn't exactly it wasn't everything I hoped it would be. You know, it, it launched on the Wii and it had waggle controls, and I didn't love that, but I did love the pointer controls, uh, like the IR aiming for for arrows and stuff. I loved yes. that. Yes, yes. Because I initially played through it on the Wii and then went back and played through it on the GameCube, and I never finished the HD version because I just didn't have the time to play games when that came out, and. Yeah, that was when my, my kid was old enough where I couldn't just, you know, plop him down somewhere and then play video games for a couple of hours. He was yeah. like, no, he demands attention. That's that's not something that you, and he's not old enough to understand liking The Legend of Zelda quite yet. So um, I hope this comes to Switch so that I have a better opportunity to play it again because, I mean, I could just play the HD version on my, my Wii U downstairs in the basement. It's just not as convenient for me to play games down here in the basement as it is to, to play them on the Switch up in the living room. A lot of the times so to have that flexibility is part of what makes me be able to play through these things. But regardless of how I felt about the final product, which was was highly I, I really enjoyed it at the time. I don't enjoy it going back to it quite as much. I I, I, lo- I feel like uh, Skyward Sword stuck with me a little bit more than this, mm-hmm. uh, though. This does have one of the coolest last boss fights in the franchise. Uh, all the wolf stuff I just wasn't crazy about. And that's so yeah. much of the game. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it's you know l- a little bit of a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. You know, a little good, a little bad, but all in all, this was an excellent pick, a, a great, great tune. And Thank thanks for picking it. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, anytime. All Ooh. right, so I'm up next, and I did tell the truth that there wasn't going to be any music from a link to the past. Uh oh. What? Yeah. Wait a second. It was a little bit of a lie because I'm picking a song from The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds for 3DS, which is a lot of music from A Link to the Past, but, you know, recorded differently. Uh, There's a lot of great music in A Link Between Worlds, and I don't like this game nearly as much as most people seem to. People Mm -hmm. loved this game. And I have this one, like, stupid nitpicky thing that really bugs, bugs me about it. Which is the fact that low roll? I mean, first off, seriously, low roll, high roll, and low roll? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Even by my standards, that's that's some low hanging fruit, pun intended. Uh, uh, but uh, the thing that bothers me about it is that low roll is the dark world from A Link to the Past, right? Yeah, right. it's exactly the dark world from A Link to the Past. But the dark world from A Link to the Past is the golden land that was transformed from Ganon's heart. That was the reflection of Ganon's heart. That was the Golden Land. Why the hell doesn't... Sorry. Why the heck does an (laughs) alternate dimension look exactly like what was supposed to be Ganon's heart reflection of the Dark World? If you were going to make low rule this whole different thing, wouldn't it have been awesome if that was a completely new thing? Because first off, Mm. you've set this game in the, like, a hundred years in the future from A Link to the Past, and nothing has changed on the overworld. There's, like, no... The buildings are in the same place. They look the same. Like, I understand this started life as a remake of A Link to the Past, but once they made the decision that this was going to be a unique thing, and the fact that this world still looks the way it looks this much later i really had a problem with that now i know that 
that's kind of silly nitpicky stuff especially when the game itself was so good it plays so good the puzzles are great the dungeons are great I loved all that and the story was really cool too but those little things just those lore things bothered me so much and I hate that it bothers me so much and I'm sure I'll get over it the next time I play the game but the music was a real treat and this song in particular, Low Rule Main Theme, is uh, one of my very favorite renditions of one of my very favorite songs in A Link to the Past, which was the Dark World theme. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to it. This is, uh, let's see, Low Rule Main Theme from The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds by Ryo and Nagamatsu. Enjoy. <laughs> from The Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds and uh, it's uh, probably my, <laughs> probably my favorite rendition of the Dark World theme I, I've ever heard I it nails it just it just lands <laughs> it just nails it so so perfectly it's ah what'd you think I was alright <laughs> <laughs> no I absolutely uh a fantastic rendition of that that's that's another melody um that is to me synonymous with the legend of zelda uh franchise um the 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 bongos just perfect the single like violin uh, it's perfect it's it's just like every choice and instrumentation uh that went into this soup is just so tasty like what a, what a great it's you know if it, it feels the same way the banjo gaiali cover does yeah which, yeah it just it it just encapsulates um you know that that legend of zelda vibe the idea of of adventure because like to me that piece feels it, uh how do i put it it feels bigger than it actually is because if you really if you really dissect it there's only a handful of um you know instruments there right yeah but, it's very mariachi band yes I, which I'm is a, totally different from what the original version was you know the original mm-hmm. version uh was strings and whatnot and this is strings very, but very much more <laughs> much less orchestral and right yet, i was gonna say very staunchly or- orchestral versus this you know uh take 
on it, if you will. And yet it still contains everything that made the original mm-hmm. as imposing as it was, especially since this it starts with that sweeping orchestral sound and then transitions yeah. into this. Uh-huh. It's genius. Oh, absolutely. It's it's such a it's just such a like a you know, you it's that thing where you, you take a classic and you're like, Well, I can't get much better than this and someone's like, Hold my beer. <laughs> you know, this is definitely that hold my beer moment. This is uh, just a beautiful, beautiful rendition of that of that classic. Just fantastic. Well, uh, speaking of things with a bit of a mariachi vibe, yes, uh, it's time for your last pick. Si, senor. <laughs> no, I speak Spanish better than that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. As I s- kind of touched on with the last track. I'm a fan of mixing genres. Um, we were talking about how the original uh, instrumentation of, of uh, Low Rule was, or, or rather, the that that piece of music is, is almost staunchly orchestral, and then you know move up to um, the link between two worlds, and then they decide to take it in in this direction, which as you pointed out, has a fairly mariachi vibe. I love when that happens. And when it, it's like, it's like when it happens and it's good, it's good. But when it happens and it's great, like stand back. Um, but, but I have a soft spot in my heart for like international music. Uh, I don't exactly like seek it out, but when I hear it, I'm like, yeah, it's like, that's so awesome. Uh, Gerudo Valley from once again Ocarina of Time uh, is again another. It's it's like a jewel amongst a crown, you know this beautiful jewel encrusted crown. It's like I, I love them all, but Gerudo Valley is just one of those things. So uh, I'm just I'm just gonna shut up. You're gonna listen to Gerudo Valley from the Ocarina of Time, and you're gonna enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, man, you want to talk about memorable songs from Ocarina of Time. That is one of them. <laughs> I mean... And that it comes so relatively late in the game, too, mm-hmm. where it's... Just, yeah, you're st- we're still going to hit you with new stuff. You think you've seen all that this game has to offer, but we promise you haven't. And, yeah, you you, you jumping Epona over that, ga- over that bridge, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. what a memorable scene that was. And it seems super quaint when you play it now. Like, ah, uh, okay. But you know, back then, you know, 3D playing a 3D Zelda was still such a novel thing. It was, it was such an epic kind of thing. And this song, mm-hmm. this song is good. <laughs> this song is good. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it starts with that flamenco uh, sound. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And like, like I love, I love flamenco guitar. I have such a like a respect and appreciation for those that can play guitar flamenco style. It's 
it's such a talent um and then the trumpet comes and it gives you that mariachi vibe like there's just so much going on here and again uh you know it's the 64 so as you said like you know not the best and i can certainly hear its limitations the the percussion you know if you're familiar with flamenco it's clapping and you know if you stretch your imagination a little bit you can certainly hear it uh but it's certainly limited and so there's a part of me that would love to hear like you know just a just a couple of people throw together this you know banjo guy ali style you know what i mean uh, it would, you know, just to hear like, like true flamenco players just like, I don't know, get all over it, get all up in it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is one of those songs that's also proven to be far more malleable than I would have expected. Like, uh, during our Smash Brothers episode, I, 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 I listened to one of the ones I brought in was the, the Smash 4 version of Gerudo Valley. That's just incredibly well done. But mm-hmm. super high energy, uh, mm-hmm. and then you know, going back to the uh, Symphony of the Goddess, they the version that they played of this was, you know, super epic orchestral, like similar to what we were just talking about with um, with the Dark World theme. Right. They took this completely changed the the cadence of the song and turned it into this very sweeping, uh, epic song, and it still works. Like th- this melody is is far more malleable than it, uh, than I think it gets credit for uh, cuz this it is it is one of the most truly brilliant pieces that Kondo has ever come up with and uh, mm-hmm. I, I love it I, I it's it was one of the more memorable parts and not just because I kept getting caught in the stealth segments because I suck at stealth gaming which is why I stopped <laughs> playing metal gear games at a certain point like I just <laughs> want to move I'm bad at stealth <laughs> because I'm either just paralyzed with fear and taking it way too carefully, or I'm uh-huh. all gung ho all the time and I get caught. And God, the amount of times I hook shotted myself out of that room in Ocarina of Time. It's like, uh. at a certain point, these guys have got to take things out of my pockets. Like, these Gerudo guards are terrible because I've now broken out of jail. Like, this is Monkey Island levels of absurd. I've broken <laughs> out of this jail at least 15 times in the last hour. You've got a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> uh, but the song itself, you know, it's again, it's limited so much by those Nintendo yeah. sixty four instruments. With the uh, I, the the guitar sound itself isn't bad, but it's the you no, not get at those all. trumpet, the trumpets in there. It's like that's a keyboard. <laughs> that's yeah. not a tr- that's a keyboard, and it ever so slightly takes me out of the moment. But yeah, not when I was playing the game originally. You know, when I first heard this and. What what sounded like this in a Zelda game before this? Nothing. That's very uh, true. Yeah. Hey, this this was just yet another wild turn in uh, a franchise full of wild turns, and uh, it's it's just one of the best songs in the franchise. Great great pick. I I couldn't agree with you more. All right, uh, we're up to our last song. Oh. Yeah, but I'm, there's just so much good music, though. We'd be right, here I mean, for a week, we we could have gone through, I and mean, we're eventually going to hit. You know, as long as, as yeah. long as we're alive, we're going to keep doing yeah. this podcast, and we're going to eventually get through all the Zelda games. So, well, maybe not all of them. I'm not going to dedicate an entire episode to Faces of Evil, but <laughs> maybe you do like an offshoot episode. Where you're like, uh, yeah, maybe we do one where we listen to music from all three of those games. For part of it, maybe we'll do a CDI special, and I'll throw in something from Hotel Mario or oh Voyer goodness, or Kether. Or, I don't know. Threaten me, Voyer. With oh my god, <laughs> you are you are really like ringing some bells that got some dust on them right there. <laughs> wow. Um. Anyway, uh, yeah. This next song is not just my favorite. A song from my favorite Zelda game. It's not even just my favorite Zelda song. It's one of my favorite pieces of music ever. I love this song so much that uh, when we hired musicians to play at our wedding, this was one of the songs that I bought sheet music for for them to play. Uh, it's um, This song is emblematic of my relationship with Wind Waker. I mentioned before that when I first saw the trailer for Wind Waker, I was, I was disgusted. <laughs> I was like, this is what you showed me a couple of years ago, okay? This is what you said Zelda could look like on the GameCube. 
and then you give me this Looney Tunes garbage. And I love Looney Tunes, but not in my Zelda game. And he's, you know, the Moblins are chasing after Link, and then they're running on the air, and then they fall down all cartoony, and Link winks at the camera, and I was like, you have gone too far in the wrong direction here. This <laughs> is trash. I was so angry. And then coupled on top of that, there was a new Mario game where he's running around with a water pack on his back, and the next Metroid game was going to be a first-person shooter by an untested American developer. I had, I was utterly gutted at that point as a Nintendo fan. It was like, this is not going to go well. And I was so upset about it that I wrote into my favorite video game magazine at the time, Aww. Electronic Gaming Monthly, and Aww. I got letter of the month for that. What? So my letter was printed in that issue, and they responded like, okay, you might be going a little too far. Let's wait and see what the game is like. Super Mario Sunshine I loved. And I still love playing that game. As long as you don't try to 100% it, I stand by the fact that, that game has got a great personality and is a lot of fun. <laughs> Metroid Prime is nothing short of an absolute god-tier masterpiece. Correct. Metroid Prime is, especially the first one, is mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And Wind Waker went from, this looks like a knockoff Looney Tunes pile of trash, to when they showed the game playing at E3, I think the following year, before it had come out, <clears throat> I saw gameplay of somebody running around Outset Island, and it clicked with me immediately. I'm looking at it like, oh my god, this isn't Looney Tunes, this is Samurai Jack. Mm. And I immediately clicked how utterly beautiful this world was, and yeah. where... It looked to me like this is nothing I want out of a Zelda game. Right. To just flicking a switch of, no, you are wrong. This is everything you want out of a Zelda game. That all you, you didn't have even to know. Do, all you have to do is open your mind. Celtic music, not yes. my favorite thing in the world. It's um, neat. I appreciate it, but it is not my favorite thing in the world. Okay. When I first heard Tact of Wind as the <laughs> title screen music, it's got a very Celtic vibe to it. Right. And it was nice. It was okay. But I thought it was kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. And then when you beat the game, you get to hear the full version of Tact of Wind. And it is stunning. It is amazing. And it finally made sense to me. It, pulls the, it pulled the melody together when I heard the rest of the song. And I... It, taught me to appreciate what was already there that I didn't realize I liked as much as I did. And it's so emblematic of the entire game because that's how I felt at, to, to begin with. I hate this. No, actually, I love this. I just needed to stop being an idiot and <laughs> turn off my expectations and appreciate what's actually there, yeah. not what I want to be there. Right. And it's one of the many, many reasons why The Wind Waker is my favorite video game of all time. Mm. <laughs> And uh, why this song is just really sitting up there on the top of the list of some of my favorite songs, period. Uh, so we're going to listen to the full version of Tact of Wind from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker by Kenta Nagata, Hajime Wakai, Toru Minigishi, and Koji Kondo. I don't know how many of them actually worked on this, but that is the uh, sound staff for Wind Waker. And uh, it's a little bit of a long one because it is the song that plays throughout the entire credits. It's going to pull in pieces from several songs from Zelda history, and it's simply a masterpiece. Please enjoy Tact of Wind.
Just gonna pull myself together there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not crying. You're crying. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh my god. Oh. <sighs> okay, so I mean, I talked a bit about the experience of, of of how this song reflects how I I experienced Wind Waker in general, and there's an extra kind of step to it that I that I wanted to mention that culminates in this song. Uh, besides the fact that it follows up, like, have you beaten Wind Waker before? Uh, I gotta be honest with you, if I did, it was so long ago. The last fight against Ganon <laughs> in Wind Waker is, uh, it was one of the most memorable things that's ever happened in a video game. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who's never played it before, because there's a very good chance that this game is going to come to Switch. And if you're a listener to this show and you've never played this game before and you've never beaten this game before, just you're not ready for the way this fight ends. <laughs> <laughs> you're you are because I wasn't I'm playing. I'm playing this last fight. It's in, it's so beautiful and it's so incredibly it, it's it's challenging and it's really, really intense. And then it just ends. And the way it ends is like, I gasped, audibly gasped when this happened. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> and then Link steps back and I'm just holding the controller in one hand, like looking at the screen, like that is what happened. Because at first, like, did that just, did he just, he did what <laughs> and then the rest of the ending happens and then this song plays and when it starts you've got what you would traditionally consider the most obnoxious instrument in the history of the planet you've got bagpipes you've got a <laughs> repetitive squeaky flute and you've got bagpipes in what you hear of this song during the intro but then the song is reprised twice in the game, where these two characters that you meet learn that they are to become sages, and they do that from hearing uh, pieces of music and learning pieces of music from sages of generations past. And the first one learns on a harp the... Da, 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 da. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. beautiful. It's so beautiful. And then the second one is learned on a violin. The da, 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 da. And that part, you, so you hear that song reprised in these remarkably gorgeous ways twice throughout the course of the adventure, which then gave me more of an appreciation for that title screen music, right? Mm -hmm. Which I've, I'm already so in love with this game. And now hearing the title screen music played in these really, really beautiful ways, deconstructed, really just made me appreciate it more. But then when you get to hearing it over the staff credits and you hear it in its full version, and we often talk about how important bass is, mm -hmm. the bass line <laughs> changes everything in this song. And it takes what was something that seems like it's just going to be this repetitive, somewhat obnoxious thing in the beginning and turns it into something that is breathtakingly beautiful where it, the, the bass line just kind of take this, this different bass line playing underneath this melody changes it intrinsically in, in, in ways that I could never have imagined before I had heard it in the first place. Mm. And I just sat here in my chair, just like through, just like through the romance scene, uh, the romance theme from Skyward Sword. I, I didn't try to do anything else while listening to this. I sat in the chair, I turned the volume all the way up, and I closed my eyes and just listened to every piece of this song come together, pure magic with bits of the the overworld ocean theme from Wind Waker, the regular, the original uh, Zelda overworld theme from the original game, Zelda's lullaby from uh, Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time, all bleeding in and out of this this wonderful, wonderful song. So you get to that part almost towards the end where you have that secondary fiddle thing going, the da -da 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 playing in your left ear while the second half of Zelda's lullaby is playing in the right ear 
And then it culminates in that big, sweeping, heavy cello bass line underneath uh, the culmination of those two things together. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of music I've ever heard. It's... I don't even remember what I said about it. We did our Wind Waker episode ages and ages ago. It was, uh, it was one of Vicky's choices. And I didn't even want to do it that early. But how could I say no? She's like, I want to do Wind Waker. I'm like, well, it's really out of order. But it's my favorite game of all time, so let's do it. And I don't even remember <laughs> what I said about this song then. I'm sure it was equally as drivelly as whatever I'm word barfing <laughs> right now. But God, I love this song with all of my heart. <sighs> Um, there's nothing I can say that can follow that up, but I will try anyway. Um, as <laughs> I mentioned, could never bef- be replaced, but we replaced you. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> toodles. Um, no, <laughs> as I, as I mentioned before with, um, Gerudo Valley and, uh, the piece before it, I am a fan of, um, international music. Uh, you said you weren't too big a fan of, of Celtic music. You, you appreciate it. I I like it. I like it a lot, actually. Um, but like a lot of um, music, I can't listen to um, a lot of it, you know, piled on top of each other. Um, that being said, though, this track is um, by far like... Audio bliss on wax. I I don't know what to say. Like it's it's fantastic. It's just absolutely fantastic. Um, given, uh, gee, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, okay, all the proper instrumentation of you know Celtic music, which then lends itself. Uh, in part because of the melody to again going back to that nautical uh, that nautical sense that I had mentioned before with um, uh, Storm Uh, but of course uh, Wind Waker is more nautical uh, in gameplay Um, all encompassing you know track for a game that is you know so you know the gift wrap on top of the package that, that is this song and that is that game um, you know, uh, uh, instruments that are the instruments rather that are chosen are um, authentic to the um, style of music. Like they didn't try and you know sneak something in there that doesn't belong. You know, a lot of care was given uh, in choices of, of instrumentation, and it shows. A lot of care was given, period, to the song. It just. I jokingly said, like, you know, I'm not crying. You're crying. What are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I guess uh, to say, like, without context, because I, I clearly don't remember the ending. Um, and and without context in the confines of just a podcast about video game music, to hear that somewhere, I would just, it would fill me with such uh, emotion. Uh, it would, you know, it, it makes my head swell with visions and and. and playing out scenarios and stuff of what I could see against this. You know, it's, it's what I do when I listen to um, music without lyrics. It's just... Uh, and, and it's dynamic, you know? Um, you, get, you get these parts that swell and they move you to a place and then, and then it, it backs off and, and you get to breathe a little bit. And then something else kind of comes in, fills the space, but not in an intrusive way. Uh, it's it's like music making 101. This is composition. This is orchestration 101. Like it's it's like how to manipulate the human heart through music. It's it's such a good piece of music. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that you in, in, enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I only thought it was okay, though. I mean, like, but, you know, it's whatever. <laughs> it's always one of those things where it's uh, you find something that I've, where where I just absolutely love a, a piece of music, and it always is kind of scary to 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 put that love out there and then hear somebody else say like, "Well, that's crap." 
<laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that goes with with ev- anything and everything. You're like, this is the yeah. best apple pie I've ever had. And you're like, eh, it's all right. And you're like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, I get it though. <laughs> but but no, it's it, but to be truthful, like when it does come to things like music, you know, because music is such a universal language, and like it does so much to so many people and so many different things to people. And when mm-hmm. it tugs at your heartstrings, and you really have like a very strong emotional connection to it, again, especially with music. Um, and when you share it with someone and you, you really like, you really want them to feel exactly what you're feeling. And, you know, if, if it falls short or they don't, you, you know, you, you, I, I, I know what that feeling is like, what you don't like, like, really? Then maybe you should listen to it again. Like, no, you should tell us you know, like, no, it's, it's okay, dude. Like I get it. I totally, I totally get it. You, you're, you're really putting, you, it, it feels like you're, you're legit like just taking your heart out and you're like hey have a look at this and they're like meh <laughs> so, nah yeah i don't i don't know that you and i will ever have that moment good music yeah. is good music it doesn't i don't care what it is if it's good it's it's effing good and and you know it's it's gonna be seen well there you have it i think that's uh I think that'll tie things up uh, a <laughs> nice little nice little bow for us. Uh, that's our show. Join us next time when uh, we will be jumping into a bit of a random pick. Uh, yep. We're doing a lot of anniversary stuff this year. There are a lot of big anniversaries, and we're going to be covering a lot of them. But uh, March is kind of light on those. So Matt and I are just going to pick a couple of random games. My <laughs> pick is one that I've been wanting to do for quite a long time. It is Game & Watch Gallery 2 for the Game Boy Color. I'm very curious. <laughs> I the only game and watch experience I have is probably that very first, you know, clamshell. Game and Watch Gallery 2 for the Game Boy has a soundtrack that is no business being as good as it is. Ah. So, I'm very excited to listen to it. Uh and it's going to be it's going to be a good one. Well, I will be here for that. Anyway, we here at the Waveback Podcast are incredibly grateful to everyone who listens, and we love communicating with you when we can. And we have a couple of ways you can do that. There's the Geek Aid Discord channel, in which we have a Waveback chat, where we frequently discuss all manner of stuff relating to video game music and whatever our next episodes are going to be. And we also have a Waveback forum page on Facebook, which you can find by searching Waveback on Facebook. Of course, you can always still send us a message, a, an email at mail at geekade.com. And while you're at it, please check out all our other social media channels, which you should totally find follow, like, and subscribe to if you haven't already. And be sure to check out all the other great original content we have on our site over at geekade.com. Let's do a couple of plugs. Matt, what have you got going on? Uh, as always, I still have the Twitch streaming of our D&D game every other Saturday. Um, let's see. It just gets uh, more and more interesting as our characters... Um, attempt to uncover the mysteries that is the dark prince okay uh i will plug my new youtube show which i mentioned earlier uh over on the stone age gamer youtube channel i have a new show called stone age gaming where i'm going through various bits of interest in my collection and talking about them uh the first step they're they're supposed to be kind of short episodes but the first episode i decided to do on my complete u.s collection of zelda games and it's about an hour long (laughs) Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, if you got the time, watch it in a couple of chunks. You know, you don't have to just sit down and spend 50 minutes watching me uh, yammer on and on. But, you know, either way, uh, check that stuff out. I'm putting a lot of effort into it, and I'm really happy with the way it's coming out. Nice. Uh, so we are going to leave you tonight with a, uh, a bit that came off of the Legend of Zelda 25th anniversary bonus CD that came with the uh, Skyward Sword release. Uh, you got the special edition, you got the, the bonus CD. And this is the Legend of Zelda 25th anniversary medley. I can't believe this is from 10 years ago. Uh <laughs> But it's a, it's a pretty wonderful medley of a bunch of songs throughout the Zelda franchise. Uh, it's a little bit of a long piece. It's eight minutes long, but it's eight minutes of pure Zelda joy. And I can think of no better way to leave off our Zelda anniversary celebration for this year. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time.
Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. Your Majesty, Ganon and his minions have seized the island of Korodai. Hmm, how can we help? It is written, only Link can defeat Ganon. Great, I'll grab my stuff! <laughs>